Muy bien, bienvenidos a esta, esta oportunidad en donde tenemos el privilegio de tener al doctor Richard Bandler, mente creativa de la PNL, aquí con nosotros, en donde nos va a hablar, primero principal, del de primer capítulo de su libro, que se llama Las reglas, que él utiliza cuando va a trabajar con una persona. ¿Cuál es esa mentalidad que él tiene? ¿Cuál es esa perspectiva que tiene? Inclusive antes de que la persona abra su boca. Aunado a eso, ¿verdad? Las personas que iban llegando, eh, los trainers, los de diferentes institutos, porque eh, son muchos, en base a eh, eh, cómo iban entrando, se les iba dando, el doctor Barlow les iba dando la, la oportunidad para que hicieran sus preguntas. Y todos ustedes, abajo a la derecha, abajo a la derecha, cuando eh, Poliana en un minuto lo, lo, lo a, de acceso, van a poder tener la, la posibilidad de traducción simultánea. Daniel va a poder tra, traducir simultáneamente. Yo creo que ya lo están traduciendo, ¿sí? Y eh, si no, lo van a poder hacer. Um, el doctor Bandler va a comenzar, como les dije, y luego ya tenemos las preguntas preestablecidas. Daniel las, las va a decir y después el doctor Bandler las va a contestar. Este, este webinar va a quedar completamente grabado. Todos van a tener acceso a esto. Se les va a enviar el, el, el video para que puedan literalmente utilizarlo para lo que se debe. Y es que ustedes se diferencien de las personas que estudian un practitioner por 7 dólares, por 20 dólares, que le entreguen 7 certificados en una semana en donde le enseñan línea del tiempo, tiempo de la línea, y dentro de poco agarras unos cornflakes y sacas un certificate de PNL. No, la idea es que aprendamos cómo se debe, ¿de acuerdo? Así que, eh, eh, Poliana, por favor, vamos a darle la... El, la a Daniel, lo de los poderes de traducción y todo el mundo, por favor, en mute. Es súper importante que la calibración es la madre de las balas digitales. Calibración, todos en mute, por favor. Ok. Y bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Daniel, tú ya tienes. Tú ya estás preparado, ¿no, Daniel? The floor is yours, Dr. Bandler. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about rules of thumb. Uh, to me, when I start working with a client, uh, the first thing that, that I take for granted is that everything about them works perfectly. There may be things they don't like, but it works perfectly to do what it does. So when people come into me and tell me they're depressed, I know they have a machine that depresses them and that it's a learned machine versus something that needs to be understood. The real difference between my work and the work in psychology is that psychology is founded and grounded in the idea that started with Freud. Freud had the idea that if you understood how you got screwed up and you understood it, that you would have an insight and that insight would produce understanding, which would produce change in and of itself. It's been tried for a hundred years. It just doesn't work. Um, my work is based on the idea that you're a learning machine. You learn a lot of stuff that's good and a lot of learn some stuff that's not so good. And the most of the things you just don't haven't learned yet. And that until you build the correct neurocortical pathways to be able to make good decisions versus making bad decisions or repeating bad decisions, uh, you'll keep doing it. And when people talk about beliefs, when people talk about self-esteem, all these words are verbs that have been turned into nouns. When people talk about problems, they don't think that they're doing them. They think they're happening to them. And you see, getting people to own their own behavior and their own thoughts gives them access to the possibility of changing it. So my rule of thumb is to test, to find out if I can make whatever it is they're telling me worse. If I can find out enough about their thought processes and the direction that their feelings are moving, that I can amplify it and make it worse, then I know I can make it better by reversing it. And so to me, that's that's the first rule of thumb. Can I make it worse? And of course, the only way I can do that is by getting them to participate in it. 
once they learn they can make it worse, then they can believe they can make it better. And if you don't believe you can get better, you don't try things. And getting people to try changing their thought patterns to make something worse and then finding out to make it better. Now, the other thing is what I call the spider test. And this comes from having done phobias for years and years and years to find out if people can trigger themselves to feel bad without whatever it is that makes them feel bad. Trigger has become a very popular word, at least here in the United States, talking about this triggers me and that triggers me and this sets me off. And all of that kind of talk assumes that it's a cause effect relationship. And the thing is, is if you can just think about a spider or a snake or being in a high place and get scared, it's not the spider that scares you. It's the thought of the spider. And there's nothing easier to change than thoughts themselves. Uh, now, the third the third thing is, is to understand that a lot of things require acquisition. Learning strategies are very important. And if there's no strategy for something, they don't have any way to map the territory. You see, NLP started with the idea that the map is not the territory. It comes from Korzybski. It comes from all kinds of ancient philosophers. They kept saying that, you know, your thoughts are not the world. Your thoughts are a representation of the world. We take that literally. And in order to do that, in the structure of magic, which I wrote in 1973, it was released as a class handout in 1973 and actually published in 1975, states quite clearly there are three mechanisms that distinguish between your map and the world. One of them is in order to build a map, you have to delete some things and not others. You also have to distort some things and not others so that you call one chair and another chair and we call them all chairs and we think of them as having the same function. Your ability to, to generalize from one thing to another is a form of distortion. Now, once you build a generalization, you build a neural cortical pathway that, that constitutes a learning that functions in and of itself. When you have those and they're looping and it's creating for you bad feelings or making you unable to do something, you either have to territorize and build new territory, which requires a new mapping skill, or you have to change the way you're mapping what's already there so that it will allow you to succeed in life and prosper and grow and be happy and functional and manifest in this world. The people who are the happiest, when I wrote the, the book, The Secrets of Being Happy, it was all about what it takes in order, that's what distinguishes happy, cheerful, prosperous people from those that aren't. And people went through the same bad things like the Holocaust, Jewish people that were in that same prison. Some came out and were destroyed by it. Some came out and were totally productive. The difference between those things is that they had a purpose. And giving people a better purpose is part of what makes them functional. So what's our first question? Yelvis, you can unmute and once. Hola. Yo quisiera eh, preguntarle al doctor Bandler cuál sería la estrategia para la psoriasis. Uh, Yelvis wants to know which is the strategy you use for psoriasis? Uh, typically, I don't treat psoriasis anymore. They have medication okay. for that. But uh, with most of the times, the psoriasis gets worse when people are in stress. It's one of many, many anxiety disorders. That The fact that it's not there all the time tells you it's coming and going. And uh, they whatever gets triggered that causes the psoriasis, they now have ways of treating medically. But that doesn't treat the real problem. The real problem is that the level of stress is still rising up. It may not manifest as psoriasis on somebody, but uh, I found that two things were incredibly helpful. One was uh, full spectrum light. That it coincidentally, I, I wrote a book for a magician and he had psoriasis and I wanted to film him doing the tricks and literally put pictures in the corners of the page so you could flip through them. So I made him roll up his sleeves and he had all the psoriasis on his arms. And I told him, you know, we basically Photoshop it out. 
And but he sat there for 12 hours a day doing card tricks under full spectrum light, uh, which were old photographic lamps. And the psoriasis just disappeared. And once it disappeared, I took him out in the sun, made him sit in the sun by the side of my house because I had a swimming pool at the time and turn around and get lots of sunlight because most people don't go out in the sunlight. And if they do, they cover up the psoriasis. Uh, the other thing is, is I put him in a deep, 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 deep trance and taught him what relaxation was. Because on a scale of, you know, positive one to a thousand and negative one to a thousand, most people think that they're at rest biologically at about 500. So they're, they're already halfway into being totally stressed out. So when they start to get stressed, it starts cracking the ceiling. And uh, when you teach people where zero really is, so that they can be balanced both in their body and in their mind, which means they have to learn how to sit so that they don't have shearing force. When you lean forward, shearing force is pushing on the back of your head. When you lean your head back, it's pushing on your forehead. If you lift up an arm, that arm has got shearing force pushing it down. And you have to learn to be able to sit so that shearing force isn't torturing you all of the time so that you can zero your body. You also have to learn to zero your mind so that you can talk to yourself, make pictures and move your feelings in a way where you are, you're, you're not overly relaxed. I'm not talking about ultra deep trance. The worst case of anxiety that I had was somebody that bit their fingernails completely off on every single hand. They had chewed off every fingernail. There wasn't a trace of them left. And even when he came in, he was so tense and so fidgety, he was still chewing on them. And it annoyed me. So I put him in a deep trance and told him to relax. I left him there for an hour. And when I finally started waking him up, I woke him up just enough so that he was at a zero. You should be this conscious and you should be this relaxed. And for the first time in years, he was finally calm. One of the byproducts of this was, by the way, his psoriasis disappeared. I didn't even know he had it. He came back six months later and told me, what you did with me in this group cured my psoriasis. Well, it didn't cure it. It just it cut off the doorway to access. If you get too stressed out, your psoriasis kicks in. And uh, with any anxiety-related disorder, and I talk about a lot of them in the book, it all boils down into knowing how to go into the state to refresh your body and refresh your mind. A lot of people do this with meditations of various sorts. Uh, your body should do it instinctively, I think. I think building an instinct, almost like a series of post-hypnotic suggestions that constantly bring people back to zero will eliminate most of that. Um, you know, They can treat the symptoms of psoriasis with drugs, but they have drugs for everything and they work on some people and not others. And uh, especially- and especially for the people that the drugs don't work on, uh, they need an alternative. And oddly enough, the, the alternative is to not go into stress so we don't trigger it off. And worrying about psoriasis makes it it's, it's the worst thing you could worry about when you start to have it. You should do exactly the opposite. So what's our next question? Then we have Federico that asked, uh, what is your strategy that you use based on your work uh, with people with insomnia? ¿Cuál es la estrategia que utiliza con insomnia? Y al final, acuérdense que le vamos a pasar los subtítulos. Go ahead, Dr. Brown. Well, insomnia was not something I suffered from, but very early in my career, I had an executive of a big telecommunications company come and uh, and he told me that he couldn't sleep but just a couple hours a night. And, and when he would try, he would sleep and wake up and sleep and wake up. But it took him forever to go to sleep. He said it took him three or four hours to go to sleep. So I took normal NLP and elicited his strategy for waking up and found out, you know, that when he woke up, you know, he would start talking to himself and then he would talk faster and faster and faster and start talking about the things he had to do, visualizing the day and he would wake up. And what I literally did was reversed it. I had him instead think about sleeping all night and being really relaxed and to start to talk to himself and hear himself yawn and talk slower and lower and lower in tune. And he fell asleep right in front of me and slept in my chair for about three hours. And when he woke up, he couldn't even remember what we did. 
So I put him in trance. I had him do it over again. I had him memorize it. And I made it so that when he decided and actually laid in a bed, that automatically he would start to talk to himself in a lower tone, at a slower rate, in a sleepy voice, no matter what he talked about. Even if he was saying, I'll never get to sleep, he would have to say it like he was getting really sleepy and sleepier. And by doing this and repeating it, uh, he was able to sleep. And over the years, I found this works with lots of people. Uh, but if I find one that it doesn't work with, I reverse engineer how they work at, wake up and just reverse it. Um, it's like the spider test. If people have a feeling where they're making a picture bigger and bigger and closer and closer, then you shrink it down and push it further and further away. Um, whatever people do, it gets an effect and the reverse of it will have the opposite effect. All right, perfect. Then um, Carla from Costa Rica, a uh, trainer of uh, society asked, Uh, what is your strategy when people say that they have low uh, self-esteem, Carla? It, was that right? Self-esteem? Uh, yes. And, and especially when there is a limiting belief associated with the thought that I, I'm not enough. Well, to start with, they're correct. That'd be the first thing. If they told me that I don't think I'm enough, I'd go, you're absolutely right. In fact, none of us are. You know, uh, we're all a work in progress. And when people go, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not enough, I go, you're absolutely right. That's part of the chiding process, that you have to get people to laugh at their stupidity or they keep repeating it. You know, if they don't feel stupid, they keep acting stupid. And therein lies the drift. That once you get somebody, because, uh, you know, I'll ask them, I'll go, I don't see any steam coming out anywhere. It's a stupid concept. You know, that, you know, if you have high self-esteem, does it buzz out your ears? I mean, it's just, it's it's where we we take processes where there are people doing things and we turn them into nouns and act like they're things. So they act like you have self-esteem or you don't. If you want to feel good about yourself, you need to do the right thing for the right reason. And you can't just do the right thing. You have to do the right thing for the right reason. If somebody drops their groceries and you pick them up so people will see how, how cool you are, you'll never feel good about yourself. But if you pick them up because it's the right thing to do to help somebody, you'll feel good about yourself. And, you know, there are plenty of laid rules that have been around for centuries to tell us the difference between right and wrong. And then in your own life, you know, you, you should know what the right thing to do is. You should have a moral gauge. And your gauge for yourself should be based on a long timeline. You know, if you're going to live, if you're planning to live, you know, to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, you should be running ahead and go and looking at what kind of person you want to be. And, you know, when people do things in the short run, when they take advantage of somebody because they can, this is what I hear from criminals all the time. Well, you allowed me to do it, you know. You know, people who borrow money and don't pay it back always say to me, you know, I said, did you plan to pay it back? And they go, well, at the time, but I'm not the same person I am now. Well, they don't have a connection through time because you have to have a connection in time, through time and between time. And if there isn't a thread that goes through it where you're the same person, you will never feel good about yourself. And you you should be a work in progress and be looking at how you're going to be better And not just now and then, but better through time so that it builds. You should build a better life as long as you're alive. And that's the secret to having self-esteem, at least good self-esteem. Otherwise, it's just a word you use as an excuse for not doing things. And the very, very beginning of all my sessions, the first thing I look for is, are they making excuses or are they acting? And people make excuses because... They don't have choices. If they had a choice, they would make one. And if they don't have a choice, they don't make one. And that's neurologically, not psychologically. If your neural pathways don't go into a loop until they habituate and then go back in the same loop over and over and over again, and you end up feeling bad about the same things. You know, shy people always tell me, they go, they go, well, I have low self-esteem, so I'm shy. 
and I'll go, how do you know when to be shy? Because you're, you're not shy sitting by yourself in a room. And they go, of course not. Like, that would be stupid. And I go, so uh, how do you know exactly when to be stupid? When do you start being shy? And they'll all say things like, well, I just, that's the magic word, just translates to only, think that people won't like me. Now, that doesn't say that people will dislike them. It says they don't think that people, I do the activity of not thinking that people will like me. So if you get them to start thinking that people will like them, they stop being shy. And they, you know, I have films out that were made in the 80s where I did this with people. And, and they left the session and went downstairs and started meeting people. That, you know, I had a guy who was a skier and he was a ski jumper. This is a nutty ass thing. You put sticks on your feet, slide down a mountain and shoot hundreds of yards off into space. And, you know, uh, here in America, we have a show that was on every Sunday where a ski jumper hit the thing and rolled down a hill and it almost killed him. Uh, and they'd show it every week. And somebody said to me in a seminar, they'd said, I'd hate to be that guy. And I said, yeah, well, let me tell you about that guy. He was my shy person. He would jump off of a mountain, but he wouldn't walk over across a room and say hello to a woman. Uh, to me, that's a very bad decision. When I look at life or death and just walking across the room, the choice is easy for me. But I'm not doing stupid things. And once you stop doing stupid things, you start doing smart things. But you have to have a choice to make a choice. And that, I mean that neurologically, not psychologically. All right. Perfect. Uh, muy bien, perfecto. Hoy mejor que ayer. Karin uh, Schultz from Chile. Hi, doctor. Thank you. Um, please, can you share your perspective about reeducation? especially in situation like trauma. What about trauma? Yeah, if you can uh, share your perspective about re-education. Re-education, like, are you saying? Re-education, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm just having a little <laughs> trouble hearing. Um, that, to me, when people are traumatized, Okay, that and the, the problem isn't that they were traumatized. Once it's over, it should be over. The problem is it's not. They, they keep replaying it in their head. They replay it life size. And it, it, the whole technique that I teach in about banishing bad memories, that as soon as you take these traumatic experiences and you put a border around them, it moves it from one hemisphere to the other. It stops being a memory and starts being a constructed image. And if you reduce it in size, it's easier to deal with. And if you tink it down to the size of a dime and blink it black and white really fast, what happens is the neurocortical pathway doesn't go into a loop and stay there. It just goes somewhere ridiculous. I mean, there's, there's no psychological meaning to blinking your memories black and white. But when you put a border around them, shrink them down to the size of a nickel, brrr, blink them black and white. What happens is, is that neurologically, it just doesn't go into a loop. It keeps going. It goes somewhere else. And after a few minutes, when you try to think about it, you just can't even hold the pictures in your head. And it's not that you don't know what happened. Everybody who's been traumatized knows it happened to them. Some people have amnesia and then psychologists tell them they have to remember it because otherwise something bad will happen. I don't even believe that. And it's not about having amnesia. It's about it, you, having control over your feelings. If you can shrink the size of the feeling and spin it in the opposite direction, you can take control over your life. Because the best thing about the past is that it's over. And the best thing about the future is you can do anything you want with it. To me, I want every client to become a boundless optimist. That's my goal with every single client. All right. Thank you very much. And now a uh, face that you know very well, Herbert from Colombia. Herbert, nice to see you Hi. again. Nice to see you again, Richard, too. Okay. Uh, Richard, my question is about um, bad feelings, kinesthetic negative. Thinking about uh, all these tragedies, or I suppose, go to end in 
positive kinesthetic. Um, what uh, do you think if all the strategies ending in negative kinesthetic is only an inconclusive strategy? In you know, sometimes bad feelings are a good thing. I'm the guy that gave that gave uh, heroin addicts uh, a phobia of needles. Okay. So bad, bad, bad or good is a decision that the conscious mind makes. The unconscious just learns neurologically to do things and avoiding some things. We have a whole list of things in the Bible that are good to avoid. Uh, it actually says in Hebrew, you know, don't doesn't say don't commit adultery. It says don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. And, you know, which is a really good idea. You can get yourself killed. Uh, you're probably better off not sleeping with anybody's wife. Uh, you know, it's just good advice. And there are some things, you know, I've had people come and they tell me, they go, I can't stop thinking about my next door neighbor's wife. And, you know, every time they think about them, they have a good feeling when they really should be having something that wasn't like that. You should, you have to be able sometimes to reduce good feelings and put one that makes them smart enough. There are certain things you shouldn't eat. When you look at certain poisonous mushrooms, your brain should go, no. This is why we're born with two natural fears, loud noises and falling, so that your mother can scream at you before you pick up a hot coal in the fireplace and make it so that you don't do it ever. And, and parents teach by, by shouting at their kids suddenly, kids to avoid certain things. You don't put your hand on the stove. You don't pick up broken glass. All of these things, we get a chance to teach people before they learn the hard way. And so having bad feelings is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a question of where and when they have them. What triggers what? Your job is to sort that out so it becomes productive. There are some people that just have to learn to avoid certain things. And they have to have something better to go towards. They have to see themselves making better choices. You, you don't you don't quit smoking just because you you, you know somebody throws you in a vat of three thousand cigarettes and electrocutes you. When I started out, there was a place that did that, and I went over and saw what they were doing. And everybody was walking outside and lighting a cigarette. It just didn't work, you know. And they were charging people three, four, five thousand dollars, you know, to go through ten of these sessions, promising them that this would get them to quit. I get people to quit because I have them see themselves not smoking, and ask them, do you want to be that guy? And when they look at it, I make the picture big enough, I spin the desire fast enough that they desire it more than a cigarette. And then I make it so that when they feel withdrawal from cigarettes, right, instead of their brain going, oh, God, I need to smoke, it goes, hey, I'm going through withdrawal. I'm doing exactly the right thing. They get an endorphin rush from it, and it's, then they look at the big picture, and they go this way instead of the old way. Uh, this is called learning. This is when the machine works for you rather than again you. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. Dr. Bandler, now a familiar face, Jimmy Asama, a trainer, I uh, believe, from Argentina, now lives uh, otherwhere. He trained Meli, I believe. <laughs> he there we go, Jimmy. Otherwhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's creative. Hi, Richard. He lives... So you're from Otherware. Otherware, yes. <laughs> nice to see you, Jimmy. Nice to see you. How do you help people with fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia? Yes. Uh, I, I, I teach them uh, both hypersthesia and anesthesia. Um, I, I teach them that hypersthesia is where you become ultra sensitive to something. I, I teach them to turn the pain up. Right. And then I teach them to turn the pain down so that they eventually can do it. I usually start with one part of the body. You know, I'll take an arm or wear or a leg or something and uh, I'll put them in the trance and I'll, I'll numb the leg. And then I'll make the other leg hurt twice as much and go back and forth from one to the other, from one to the other, because everything there is should have an on off switch. And fibromyalgia is is like epilepsy of the nervous system. It's firing a bunch of nerves off that that there's no reason to fire off. And uh, there's nothing like a good deep trance to get people to make better choices about stuff like that. Uh, I, I had one person who had fibromyalgia, and I literally put them in a trance and had them see a hot coal on their leg. 
and uh, and it burned them so much. And then I asked them when it was burning them, did they feel the fibromyalgia? And they went, of course not. My leg was burning. It was on fire. And then I said, I said, but it wasn't really on fire. It was the thought that made it burn. And when people think about things like that, it always makes it worse because they go, oh, it's starting again. You know, that's the wrong suggestion to give yourself. People have to have a safety place they can go, a button in their head they can press, and all that calms down. And they start thinking about something more important, like a popsicle. Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you very much. And uh, I have a question that a uh, trainer of ours asked in Spanish. So I'm going to uh, say it in Spanish first because it doesn't speak English. Um, un trainer preguntó, ¿cómo puedes ayudar a un niño? Me imagino que a un niño, adolescente, niño, que tiene depresión. So the question, Dr. Brownler, is um, how, can, how have you helped children just before they become teenagers, they go off, uh, that say that they're depressed? Well, well to tell you the truth, I haven't found kids that are depressing themselves. Mostly they're being depressed by what's around them and who's around them. And uh, like I said, I've worked with people who were in concentration camps, including kids that were children in concentration camps that got out and are cheerful, happy people. That when the circumstances around you are depressing, the best choice is to have a sense of humor. And that's how people survived at concentration camps and prisoners of war camps and all of those horrible things was that the whole time they made jokes about it because there wasn't anything they could do about it at the time. But if your brain doesn't go into the future and go, I'm not gonna be here forever and start thinking about what you're gonna do when you get out of a horrible situation. I had a kid that was so depressed, he was trying to commit suicide. And uh, you know he wasn't very good at it to tell you the truth. And he took a bunch of pills and tried to kill himself and ended up in the emergency ward. They pumped his stomach. And when I talked to him on the phone, his uh, a friend of his, his father asked me if I would zoom and talk with him. I said, I said, I said, what possessed you? I mean, what do you have to think to want to try to kill yourself? And he said, well, he said, I'm not good in school. This is a kid. He's not, he's just not even in college, for God's sake. He's just a kid. You know, he's in junior high school. And he's going, I'm not good in school. He goes, I'm not athletic. He goes, there's no way I'm going to be able to succeed in life. And in the town we live in, it's so small that the only job I'm ever going to get is at a fast food restaurant. He said, I'm going to spend my whole life uh, saying to people, do you want fries with that? And he said, it's so depressing. I just didn't want to live years and years of that. So he had a long timeline, but it wasn't mapping anything out of the environment where he was. The best thing I ever did as a poor person, because I grew up poor, and I decided to move and live where rich people lived because there'd be more opportunity. So I picked myself up out of the ghetto and went somewhere where people, and it was very hard to find a place to live. I had to rent a room and it was, you know, it didn't have plumbing. It didn't have a, it didn't have a stove, but, you know, I figured, I figured other ways to eat so that I would meet the right people so that I would have more opportunity. And if you can't imagine outside of the situation you're in, right, that's a limit of your imagination. So with most people who are depressed, I have to expand their imagination to consider a world outside of the one they live in. These are people that haven't got a terrorizing device, something that can go and go, life here sucks. I'm not going to be here forever. Where would I like to be? And how can I get there? Because when you can imagine where you'd like to be, you can reverse engineer the steps to get there. All right. Perfect. One of our trainers for the last question, Eduardo Tartiglini. Hey, Eduardo, ¿cómo estás? Todo bien. ¿Puede ser en español? Sí. Uh, I'll listen to it in Spanish and I'll translate it, Dr. Bandler, for you. Eduardo, ¿cuál es tu pregunta, okay. por favor? Um, ¿Cuál es la, la principal herramienta de neuro-repatroneo hipnótico? Ok. Uh, <laughs> um, I haven't he's even asking... heard it, but I like the question. It was short. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's a, a, a very good question because you can go on it. Um, narrow repattering, where did it come from? What's the purpose of it in our job? Neurohypnotic repatterning? Yeah. Uh, NLP, when it was initially designed by myself and John Grinder, was all about changing the way you think to change the way you feel. So therefore you could change what you're capable of doing. Neurohypnotic repatterning uh, looked at the situation where we thought, you know, what if we took, instead of worrying about how people got themselves, think themselves into a, a bad place, what if we just saturated them with feelings and they don't even necessarily have to be relevant so that you take, a, uh, we started out, you hypnotize somebody, you take a set of feelings and you literally saturate the nervous system with them. Uh, endomorphemes, uh, oxytocin, all of the neurotransmitters that go with these happy states. So, you know, uh, we put people in states where everything just seemed totally funny, no matter what it was. And then we started talking about their problems. So, and while they talk about their problems, they'd be laughing, which meant they just couldn't get back to the triggers the way they were because we so saturated them with different feelings. And, you know, with people that that procrastinate, we saturate them with the feeling of determination. And, uh, and, and every time they think about an incomplete task, they suddenly feel incomplete and determined to do something about it. That, that neurohypnotic repatternings says that you change the way you feel so that you can change the way you think, so that you can change what you're capable of doing and succeeding at in the world. It's the opposite of NLP in a lot of ways. And uh, to me, it was a natural extension. I figured out both DHE and NHR mathematically first and then did them. So that I took the calculus of NLP and flipped it over and ended up with DHE. And then I took both of them together and flipped it again and came up with NHR. It was a set of mathematical computations and it led to a lot of really good stuff. Thanks, Richard. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to speak in Spanish so we can say goodbye one second. Uh, so clarify something. Muy bien. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Veo que tuvimos como todo eh, algún tipo que contratiempo. Sin embargo, si somos practicantes de PNL, una de las primeras habilidades que aprendemos es la eh, flexibilidad. ¿no? Si en un momento somos flexibles, deberíamos de romper el diploma y nos lo fumamos. Vamos a enviarle Vamos a enviarle a cada uno de ustedes. La, vamos a enviarle a cada uno de ustedes o, o la grabación con los subtítulos. Le vamos a poner los subtítulos para que tengan acceso a la grabación. Y le quiero recordar que nosotros tenemos para el doctor Bandler un canal de YouTube en donde las personas en todos los idiomas, en todos los idiomas, le envía su pregunta. Le envía su pregunta, le envía su pregunta y él contesta cuatro o cinco semanales. Ok, el, cuando llegue el email con esta grabación va a tener anexo el canal y van a poder ver y escuchar obviamente respuestas espectaculares que han dado estudiantes como practitioners de PNL, master practitioners y obviamente trainers. Acuérdense que esto es una oportunidad que, que se da poco de poder escuchar directamente de la mano de él. Eh, eh, este tipo de perspectivas de 53 años de carrera, ¿de acuerdo? Así que quiero agradecerles a las personas muchísimo por haber estado, los que escucharon en inglés y estaban buscando una que otra cosa en castellano o en español, tranquilo que todo tiene solución, ¿verdad? La gente dice, Juan Antonio, ¿qué haces tú con la gente que procrastina? Les enseño a procrastinar la muerte, es lo único. De resto, todo lo demás hay que trabajar bastante. So thank you, Dr. Bandler, very much uh, for your time. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for listening.